Happy Friday, everybody, and welcome to the Rotary Club of Brentwood. We are going to start today with an invocation by Dale Llewellyn, and the pledge and four-way test will be led by Alan Treadway. Good morning, everyone. As we uh, get ready to have the invocation, just also remember that uh, we still have members that are still convalescing and dealing with issues, Bill McCarthy, Dan Jordan, and Leon Partain. And don't forget about Sherry Koss, of course. So if you would, please bow with me and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, day. Thank you for the gorgeous weather and for the relief from some of the bad weather. We thank you for the fact that you continue to bless us in so many ways. We know that all the good gifts we have come from your hands. We thank you for that. Thank you for this club and what uh, we've been able to do in, in the way of service. We pray that you'll continue to bless us uh, with growth and that we will continue to be a factor in a, in a positive way in the community and around the world with our, with the things that we do and, and service that we provide. So bless this time, bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies in Christ's name. Amen. Now, if you would join me in the pledge to the flag, I pledge of allegiance. And for the four-way test, first, second, third, and fourth. Now I'm going to ask Keely Hall is going to introduce guests and visiting Rotarians. Totally knew I was doing that. Totally knew it. <laughs> All right. Well, first, I'm going to introduce my new friend, Jeremy Moore of the Carrollton Dawn Breakers Club in Carrollton, Georgia. Jeremy, Jeremy actually co-founded the Rotaract Club in Car of West Georgia. And then, then they told him he got too old. And so he joined the, the Don Breakers Club. He's visiting. His girlfriend is in medical school here, but he's probably moving here sometime in the next year or so, later this year. you have anything, anything to say for yourself, Jeremy? Uh, thank you for having me. It's a wonderful city. I visit, think you're like the fifth Rotary Club I've visited. There's still about 20 more. It's <laughs> a lot of you. But um, again, thank you guys for having me. It's wonderful. Certainly glad to have you. Now, I don't have another list of visitors, so if you have brought a visitor, raise your hand and I'm gonna have you introduce your guest. Start with Jennifer. Hey, this is my friend, Stephen Hall. He is with Health Market. Uh, he's a Brentwood native, so he went to high school here. Some of y'all may know him or maybe not, but uh, he wanted to come and I would love for him to, to join our so. So I have with me uh, an old friend, interestingly, also a Brentwood native. No, you're old. You're old. Uh, older than me. How about that? Uh, Michael Hurst. So Michael's a, a Brentwood native and uh, uh, grew up in Brentwood kind of in the old days, if you will. Uh, but more importantly, Michael is a director of fundraising for the Center for Youth Ministry Training which is a cause that uh, Laura and I are, are deeply behind. It actually trains our youth ministers. There's not a, uh, in seminary, there's not a program to train those who are ministering to our kids. And so um, an initiative actually from one person, uh, initially out of, uh, based out of Brentwood United Methodist Church, but it serves churches of all denominations uh, throughout the United States. And so Michael's visiting, trying to get a little more involved. And I said, well, you have to come to Rotary. Well, welcome to both of you. Any any other guests that I'm I'm scanning the room? I don't see any at the moment, but I'm missing anyone. All right, that's it. Back Thank to you, you Keith, Keith. Welcome to all our guests. Please continue to join us, and we'd love for you to consider becoming a member of our club. 
Now Jody Rawl is going to lead us in Happy Bucks. Today's Happy Bucks um, go to go toward a, a random act of kindness that our club is going to make happen for Morning Point, which is the uh, care facility that Jordan, that member Jordan Nielsen, there's Jordan, that Jordan works for. And so um, I think that'll be a really neat thing for us to go hang out where Jordan works and provide an ice cream social for the residents of Morning Point. Who's happy? I, I, I'm just putting an ice cream on. Ice cream money. I am happy to be back from uh, Mexico. Had a wonderful trip to a wonderful little town called Tlancualpican. And the highlight of the whole thing was that there was a volcano nearby named Popo Popocatepetl that actually blew up while we were down there. Uh, so I'm actually happy today. Uh, I am not typically a college basketball fan until March Madness, but because I'm donating, well, I'm paying a lot of money to Purdue University these days. I am happy because Purdue University is ranked number one in men's basketball, and it's unanimous along both polls. So you're going to have to listen to me through the end of March when they win the national championship all about Purdue basketball. <laughs> Always happy to contribute to ice cream. <laughs> I'm happy that I found out that tomorrow is National Eat Ice Cream for Breakfast Day. And I'm also donating because I'm happy that Jordan is a member. Welcome to Boilermaker Land, uh, Devin. Here you go. So, uh, hey, uh, so I'm an old guy now. I used to be a young guy in this club. And um, so this morning I got a phone call from where's Zach. I got a phone call from Zach. He said, hey, would you join uh, join us at the member? I don't even know. Membership, membership committee. And so I sat there and I listened to these youngsters, I think. And uh, great ideas, good legs, full of energy. And um, so I got to meet. Guys that I didn't know, and so uh, I'm going to screw this up. But Laura, you were in there, right? And Zach, Zach Davis, I know that. Okay, Laura, okay, you're Zach over here, James. Okay, uh, and then uh, Jared was in there. Uh, Jane was in there. Who am I missing? That was in there. Anybody else? Jennifer. Excuse me, I'm Jennifer. Okay. Uh, Curry was, was Curry in there? Curry wasn't in there. No, he wasn't. Curry. Okay. Hey, my point is, is that. Uh, these guys are working hard, and all of us old guys need to know that they're working hard. I'm going to tell you, the youngsters, they need a lot of the old guys' wisdom, that which we have, not much, but we still got a little bit. Share it with them. Get to know them. They're the ones that are going to be the direction of this club later on. And so uh, I appreciate them calling an old guy this morning to come in. Probably took way too much time talking to them. I enjoyed meeting them. And so you guys are doing a good job, so hang in there. Purdue has a good team because you know how tall our center is? 7'4". Imagine 7'4". Also, I watched, I never watched do this, but the women's team last night, Iowa had a, had as a player by the name of Clark. She scored 42 or 44 points last night. Fantastic player. As a, as a poor banker, I've always wanted to do this, and I can't think why I would do it, but I know why I'm doing it. So this is $100. That'll help some. And that's for Sue's surgery, which went great Tuesday. Uh, she will be, as soon as, as soon as I can get this guy through today and we get out of here, I'm going to go pick her up and bring her home today. So uh, it's amazing, guys. I mean, a, the surgery she had and she's going home in four days is just phenomenal. So um, we're blessed and and thank you for your prayers and your thoughts. And, uh, you know, like I said, it's just 
for Chip and I. It was Chip was there with me the whole time, and it was a, it was a quite an experience. But anyway, thank you all very much. Well, I would just like to personally thank Rod for showing up to the meeting. Thank you so much. It was late notice and tons of things that were said in that meeting to how the shape of the club, we want to grow it. So this is an open invitation until March and maybe past. We're going to meet. Um, the membership committee will meet at 11 o'clock. So if you have some ideas, you want to kind of you know throw them out there and, and give us some direction, especially the people that have been in the club for longer than myself, which isn't much. Uh, we'd love to hear that because and I that everything kind of ties into one another, right? Like we have new members that we want to, you know, bring into the club that they just don't know the Rotarians yet. And then we have members that have been in the club and they want to get more out of the club so they can give more of what you know, the gifts that God gave you. And then how we can make the best club ever. Right. So with that, you know, please reach out to me. And um, one thing we're going to probably start doing is asking people that, why did you join? So if you have been, you know, one to share your story, you have a really cool story of why I joined Rotary. We'd love to hear it so we can promote that. And then when visitors come, they can understand it's, it's more than just a Friday meeting. It's, there's more to Rotary than just that. So love to have that story. So any ideas, we're open to it. So thanks. Yeah, I'm going to match you, Larry, my $1 to your $100. So. No, I, you know, I appreciate everything Larry does and, you know, everything he's dealing with. So just want to say, man, there you go. Here's your dollar. <laughs> okay. On that note, we'll start, we're going to have a few announcements. We'll start with um, one from the Tennessee Baptist Children's Home. Oh, yeah, sure. We, um, I got a package that was dropped off in my mailbox a few days ago, and it was full of thank you notes from the kids. Um, their sweet little handwriting. Um, you guys make a big difference to them. And these kids have really difficult situations that we may never, ever, ever fully understand. So thank you for loving them. There are going to be more opportunities outside of Christmas for us to serve them, especially as they're doing their campus move. So um, just just be be open to that because these kiddos need us. And um, and I think we might need them even more. So. That's awesome. Next, we have a quick video. It's going to give you sort of uh, an idea of how successful last weekend's Harvest River Cleanup was. <laughs> Patrick, Patrick, do you want to come up and say anything? I'll just say while he's on his way up, I think we had more than 100 volunteers show up. It was very well organized. 
we got pulled some crazy stuff out of the river. We had uh, my team pulled out lots of furniture, a barbecue grill, a um, child's booster seat, all kinds of stuff. So it was a great day and Patrick uh, made it run like a machine. Uh, it succeeds in spite of me, trust me. Um, we had over 160 people. We had about, yeah, we had about 40 so scouts that were either in the parking lot that went right to their site, or we had one group that actually just started and didn't even come to the uh, gathering at the library. And if they want to get out there and they know what they're doing, maybe I'll let them run. So um, picked up over 90 bags of trash, and these were not four or five pieces of trash, you know, from Section 5 where Cal Turner's farm is. These were full bags of trash. I don't have a weight yet, but um, some people were like, I couldn't believe how clean it was. Others were like, I can't believe how dirty it was. It was just kind of hit or miss, um, but it's a great event, y'all. It really is. For those of you that came early at O Dark 30 to help me get the donuts up and get the table set up and everything, can't thank you enough for that. Um, we had over 11 scout troops and packs represented from Williamson County. Um, we had uh, just volunteers, had some folks from the Harpeth Conservancy. We had folks from um, Duke, the Duke alumni. Thank you, Ted, for inviting them out. Um, had a good showing, but I think they enjoyed that. They even had some scouts that came with them. So we got uh, some double efforts there. Um, and then we had one 80 years young lady who just showed up. Um, I think she saw it on our Facebook page would not leave without me giving her a little volunteer certificate for three hours to put on her bulletin board at her house. So we had a beautiful day. Thanks be to God. I was driving in on Thursday and it was sleeting and snowing. I'm like, okay, this is going to be great. And then I was sweating, picking up trash with the sheriff's department Saturday afternoon and putting the, pulling the cones. But um, anyway, um, great day. I'll have a, I'll have a weight total. I got a feeling it was over a thousand pounds of trash that we got. Cause we got a lot of stuff that, that uh, trailer, um, it was full when we finished up. So, yes, sir. Um, I would direct you to the landfill at this point, Rod. If you want to go down there and do a walkthrough, you go for it. Um, but anyway, thank you all very much. I couldn't appreciate you more for helping me on Saturday. Thank you, Patrick. Rod, the grill was in about four pieces, so we can't use it for pancake day. I know where your head was was on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and some of us um, did an extra civic duty by tasting the donuts before everyone else got there to make sure they were okay. So, uh, so there you go. Next, Betsy, do you want to say something? Heart disease is, is a very, very real thing. And, uh, all you can do to support the American Heart Association will be fantastic as a very active member of it. So thank you. We have red cups in honor of Go Red Day. Yeah. Uh, and so the final announcement before we introduce our speaker today is going to be uh, Chief Colvin. You may have heard that there was a recent um, robbery in Brentwood. And thankfully, that's like a huge big deal around here because we don't have very many of them. So it got lots of attention on the news and social media and everywhere else. So we asked Chief Colvin if he would give us some uh, safety tips for how we can stay safe in Brentwood. So the, the robbery event that took place in Terramore was very unusual for this area. Uh, it was a robbery at a residence as uh, two homeowners came home and were getting out of their vehicle. So that's something that happens very, very rarely. Uh, so we definitely understand the concern that that surrounds that. Received a lot of phone calls. Felt like the city was falling apart. Um, it's it's not uh, realistically. We we do have uh, about you know four or five robbery events per year um, in the city of Brentwood. Last year in 2022, there were two robbery events, and those were both at businesses. So again, this is a, a very rare occurrence. Um, from a robbery perspective, really the main thing that I would tell the public is to comply. Um, if you find yourself in a situation where uh, you're confronted by someone who is attempting to take something from you, uh, all of the things that we have on us can be replaced. So none of them are that important. Uh, comply with them and then call your police department and let us try to assist you. Um, you know, 
this particular robbery and most of them are crimes of opportunity. And there are people that are out there that are looking to prey on others. And there's very little you can do to combat that. I mean, you can always stay in a well-lit area, travel with friends if you're downtown or out somewhere, uh, make sure that you're not distracted, be aware of your surroundings and where you're going. Uh, remember where you parked your car. Don't just walk around a parking lot trying to figure out you know, where you parked. Um, when it comes to some of the property crimes that we've had, uh, you know, the, again, uh, we received a lot of emails and phone calls and concern about 20 or so vehicle burglaries that occurred overnight uh, in Wildwood subdivision and, and in Lenox as well, but in, in Wildwood primarily. And um, not as rare, obviously, as the robberies, but we do have groups that come in to prey on this area, and they're looking for unlocked vehicles most of the time. So uh, I know that Larry tells people to RSVP, and I don't know how long you've been saying that, Larry, but um, I feel like you up here because for about 18 years, I've been telling people, lock your cars, um, lock, lock your doors, take, take your valuables out of your vehicles. Um, don't leave the keys in the car because they will steal the car too. Um, if you if you go to a park uh, and you do have a purse or something of value, if you bend down to put it underneath the passenger seat, uh, the person that is there watching and waiting for the right victim to show up, they're watching you bend over and put something under your seat. So put it in the trunk before you even get there, right? So if you're going to leave your house and go to the gym and you want to take your purse or something with you, put it in the trunk and leave it there. And so when you get out, just get out of your car and go in. The bad guy's not going to break your window to pop your trunk to see if there's something in there. Okay. Um, so yeah, vehicle burglaries, lock, lock them up. Don't leave anything out in plain view. And I have to remind my wife of this. So I'll, this is the last thing I'll say. Um, bad guys don't know the purse is empty. Okay. I didn't know that women travel with like four purses and only one of them has stuff in them. And the other one, they just trade them out depending on what they're wearing or where they're going. I didn't know that, uh, but that's a thing. And so the empty purses that you know are empty, the bad guy doesn't know that those are empty purses. That's just another purse. It's another target. So they break in to take an empty purse. Um, so those are those are my tips. Is that good? Thank you so much, Chief Coleman. Now, Larry Kane is going to introduce our program for today. <laughs> Well, I have this very well-written, uh, fluffy in, in, uh, introduction for our speaker today, but I've, I read it, and there's some things that are not in this introduction that I happen to know, so I thought maybe I would share those with you before I share the fluffy introduction. Um, our speaker went to Battleground Academy in Franklin, BGA. Um, while he was there, he established the Wildcat Radio Network, which was a online broadcasting uh, vehicle that he put together, and he broadcast all the BGA football and basketball games while he was there. In addition, he was the manager of the baseball team and did some PA work there. Uh, left BGA, went to UT, worked for the Big Orange Network uh, at UT, <laughs> and uh, was on the football games doing the uh, – uh, scoring updates from around the conference. He also eventually had a halftime interview show that he did on there. Uh, he was the in-studio host for the Lady Vols basketball while he was there. And in the in the spring, he was a PA and broadcasting guy for the baseball team. After he graduated, he stayed on the Big Orange Network, continued to work the football games and uh, basketball games. He went to work for the Knoxville Smokies, uh, the professional baseball team there, and was on their broadcasting team. Uh, and he also had a radio talk show out of Sevierville, Tennessee in the afternoon, one of those two to four, th two to six things where you talk about sports. So, you know, he's going to ESPN. That's what I thought. And then um, we got this call one day from our speaker who said, Dad, I'm going to make a change. And I said, oh, you're going to TV. Because everybody kept saying he's going to I said, going to TV. He says, no, I'm going to become a policeman. Okay. So now that leads us into the introduction of what happened. Um, let's see. William Kane assumed the position of director of the Tennessee Law Enforcement Training Academy and executive secretary of the Tennessee Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission in January of 2022. Prior to assuming his current role, he worked for the Tennessee Board of Regents System as director of public safety at Roan State Community College 
and is chief of police for all of the um, regent system. I guess that's what that means. He graduated uh, from basic training at the academy in 2010, where he began his career with the University of Tennessee Police Department. He was a campus cop. He worked for the University of Tennessee and then the city of uh, Clinton uh, before becoming the chief of police for the city of Bainbury. And then after that, in 2017, the city of Norris. And that's not to be confused with Norris Johnson. Um, he earned his Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Tennessee and a Master of Science degree in criminal justice from Bethel University, uh, as well as holding a post-certified post instructor status in firearms, patrol, rifle, use of force, and emergency vehicle operations. I taught him most of that. Um, <laughs> anyway, my son, Chip Kane. I'll never send you another picture either. He just asked for one of those. Uh, uh, didn't think that was going to come back today. Uh, anyway, uh, we don't have to play the video. I know that everybody here is on a uh, on a pretty uh, tight uh, time schedule. Uh, but as my dad said, I am the uh, the director of the Tennessee Law Enforcement Training Academy. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of the Tennessee Law Enforcement Training Academy? Police Department. Right there we go. So. We're, we're kind of this uh, well-known secret uh, to, to the, the general public, but to the law enforcement agencies across the state of Tennessee that do not have their own academies, we are one of the places that they can send their officers to get training. The other places include uh, that, that train just officers from everywhere, uh, Blunt County Sheriff's Office in East Tennessee, Knox County Sheriff's Office in East Tennessee, uh, Cleveland State Community College in East Tennessee, and Walter State Community College in Northeast Tennessee. And by the way, I'm, I'm, I live in the Knoxville area, and uh, I like I, I call that Middle East, uh, the Middle Eastern part of the state. But I get some looks on that. So, um, but anyway, uh, we take officers from all over the state, uh, police officers from cities. Uh, we take deputy sheriffs from 94 of the 95 counties. Davidson County does not have a, uh, a they, they don't have any law enforcement authority, so we don't train uh, their sheriffs deputies. Uh, we train special agents from the Alcoholic Beverage Commission. We train park rangers uh, here in, uh, in the state. And so TALETA, as we call it, T-L-E-T-A, is part of the Tennessee Department of Commerce and Insurance. I work for the Chief of Staff of Commerce and Insurance, Jennifer Peck. She reports to Commissioner Carter Lawrence, who is uh, there on the left side or the uh, right side of the screen. And, uh, and then, of course, Governor Bill Lee is our boss. And there hasn't been anybody that we've ever had in this state that has been as kind and generous and as supportive to law enforcement as our current governor, the 50th governor of Tennessee. Uh, and we'll talk about the new academy at the very end very briefly. But our facility was open in 1966. That's what it looked like uh, back in 1966. We were established by an act of the Tennessee General Assembly in 1963, and it took three years to build that building. So, uh, and now we're looking at building a massive 450 to $500 million uh, campus for multiple agencies in about four years. But that's where we started. And uh, if we could go to the next slide. Just to give you a, a little bit of an overview of how much training we've done since we opened our doors in 1966, more than 23,000 police officers have received basic training and graduated from our basic police school. It started, as you can see, in 1966 at two weeks. It wasn't even a full two weeks. It was a week and then most of the next week. And, uh, and so we are 12 weeks of training, and that's uh, 488 hours minimum. But uh, we, we are working almost all year training basic law enforcement recruits. If you do the math, 12 times 4 is uh, 48. And so that's 48 out of the 52 weeks out of the year we have basic cadets on campus. So our current class sizes uh, are approximately 140 cadets. Uh, we house them, we feed them. It's about 1,500 meals per week that uh, state employees prepare in the kitchen. Uh, and so it is, a, uh, it is a massive operation. And with a building that was built in 1966, we have a lot of other very, it's lunchtime, so I won't go into detail, but we have a lot of other interesting issues uh, that pop up in the, uh, in the building as well. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, and by the way, um, if we could go back one more. Uh, by the way, when our academy opened in 1966, our country was in uh, an awful lot of turmoil uh, in the 1960s. And if you look at the history of law enforcement 
and I, I know that. Uh, there was a considerable shift in the way policing was viewed in the 1960s. There was a Blue Ribbon Commission uh, that was uh, impaneled by uh, LBJ, and they came out with uh, some training standards and some, uh, some suggestions. Uh, going all the way back, by the way, to the uh, mid to late 1960s, uh, there was already a recommendation that law enforcement officers, anybody with arrest authority and the ability to take somebody's uh, freedom away, should have a college degree. And we haven't quite achieved that yet uh, in, the, uh, in the U.S., but that goes back a long time, about 80 years. And so during this period of change, uh, that's when the Tennessee Law Enforcement Training Academy was born. The Tennessee General Assembly recognized the importance of standardized training for law enforcement officers. And so uh, that's just a little bit of background on you know, why this was established in the 1960s. Now, where, what is basic police school? Well, some agencies... Uh, will hire an officer and they'll put them in a uniform, gun and a badge, and put them out in training before they ever step foot in the police academy. Uh, that's just a, it's just a fact of life in the state. We only have a, a finite number of spots uh, in, uh, in basic training across the state of Tennessee. And sometimes officers start their training on the road. Uh, but we are what occurs after they've been hired and prior to their certification. An officer, a department has six months to enroll an officer in the basic training academy. So for, uh, for a lot of agencies, the smaller agencies that we work with, they're already working people. Now, they're with a, a certified, fully trained officer at that time, but they're already getting that training. Your larger agencies like Metropolitan Nashville, uh, Memphis, Knoxville, uh, Chattanooga, they run their own police academies. And so when they hire people, they put them straight into their own academy. They, they don't have to wait the six months. Uh, just a little bit about what we do train at Toledo. The first class the cadets get is ethics, the first class. The last formal class they get at Toledo before they graduate is ethics. There are ethical components to almost all of our training. And we might not ha have it formalized, but you, know, you can think of ethical situations in just about every single thing that we encounter. We train general police topics. We, we have a week of, of DUI detection and standardized field sobriety training. We used to do wet labs for those, which are where we have people come in and drink, and it's all in a controlled environment. And then we do uh, the, uh, the field sobriety training for the uh, cadets on them. We don't do that anymore at 140 people. Uh, it's Believe it or not, it's hard to find uh, 35 people that want to come and drink. Well, it's not hard to find the 35 people. It's hard to find the 40 or 50 people it takes to watch them. Uh, so... <laughs> Anyway, it got a little uh, un unwieldy there. Uh, we teach constitutional law. We do the first two weeks of the uh, basic police school are, uh, are practically nothing but law. They get some nutrition. They get some other things, but, but they get a lot of law. And our attorneys at work at Toledo will tell you that they feel that when the cadets walk across the stage in week 12, that they have got the equivalent of a, a first-year law student's understanding of, uh, of criminal law. So. Uh, we think we do a pretty good job with that. Uh, we teach physical skills, which include firearms, defensive tactics. Uh, we'll talk about that here in just a moment. That's ground fighting and self-defense. Uh, we teach investigations. We have a week uh, where uh, we learn about how to investigate certain crimes. We have active shooter response. Uh, unfortunately, that's something that you know we have to teach, but it's, it's critical. We cannot fail in that area. So uh, we teach some tactics in that week. Uh, I always like to say, and I know we were speaking earlier, uh, that uh, every, every police officer, every uniform patrol officer is a criminal investigator. So we, we give them a very basic uh, overview of how to conduct criminal investigations. And then emergency vehicle operations, which we'll see here in a moment. Next slide, please. Each basic police school starts with uh, what is uh, known as Hell Night. Uh, it's really uh, a two hour PT session. Uh, it does not go all night. We had a cadet in this uh, current class that complained to their chief that uh, they had uh, done PT for 12 hours on the uh, first Sunday when they checked in at, at two o'clock. And so I got an angry telephone call about why, why they were paying 12 hours of overtime for that day and, uh, and how much PT, physical training they had done that day. And uh, it's all scientific. We have a team that does nothing but the exercise portion of this. And what we do when the cadets arrive is we put them under an immense amount of stress from the first minute that they step foot on campus. And the reason why we do this is we want our cadets to be, you know, law enforcement is a stressful job. It's stressful for a lot of reasons. It's stressful when you wouldn't think it would be stressful. We have organizational stress. That can be very, very, um, uh, it can be a very heavy burden for a law enforcement officer. You know, you, uh, 
you go out and you, you answer a call or you make an arrest and then you start worrying, uh, did you do everything the right way? Uh, what's the supervision going to think of it? So officers carry an awful lot of stress, but the stress we're trying to prepare these, and we do cover that in the academy. We have a week that's uh, dedicated to officer, uh, officer wellness and how to deal with that stress so they don't internalize it. But the purpose of our paramilitary form of training is to, is to inoculate these cadets to, to, to the stress that they'll face in really critical situations. We cannot recreate the stress that an officer may feel responding to an armed robbery or stopping a, uh, you know, a vehicle on a felony stop where you've got somebody that just committed a violent crime. You know, those are things that we cannot recreate, but we can give those officers an opportunity to learn how to deal with that stress. You know, it affects all different parts of your body. It affects your auditory. Uh, you have auditory exclusion where you don't hear things. It can affect your eyesight and vision where you get tunnel vision. It can affect your ability to use your fingers, manual dexterity. And so we want these cadets to, to know what stress feels like and be able to deal with that stress so that when they're responding to an elementary school, to a report of shots fired, for example, that, you know, it's not just that they get the call and they're going to go. They've got to go from wherever they are, operate their vehicle in emergency mode with lights and sirens. That puts the general public at great risk. It puts them at great risk. Uh, and so uh, they've got to, to drive that car safely and arrive safely. They've got to use the radio while they're en route. They've got to take information in and process that information, all the while knowing that whatever it is that they're responding to might be the very last thing that they ever do on this earth. So that's why we put them uh, under stress. But everything we do is for a, uh, is for a reason. Next slide, please. Uh, firearms, very basic. We have an accuracy course, which is pretty much standing in one place and shooting. Uh, we have a night qualification. It's really low light qualification. Uh, we have a speed course. We have a stress course. Uh, those two things are similar, but they are different. The speed course is designed for speed and accuracy. The stress course, it, we do some other physical things with the cadets. We make them run and get their heart rate up to simulate how they would, uh, how they would be responding, how their body would be responding uh, in the uh, re real world. And then we have a shotgun and a long, a long gun familiarization. Uh, next slide, please. Defensive tactics. This is ground fighting. This is self-defense. These, this is use of force. Uh, we uh, used to and still have a component of duty to intervene uh, where, uh, you know, if an officer sees another officer doing something they shouldn't be doing, that uh, is included in defensive tactics. Uh, and everything we teach, we teach uh, tactics and techniques that uh, have been vetted and are known to work and to, uh, to gain compliance. And we also teach that once resistance stops, so does the force. So we are very deliberate in the things that we teach at the Tennessee Law Enforcement Training Academy. Uh, testing is both static and dy dynamic. What you're seeing here, the picture, is a uh, static test where we go over some very basic maneuvers, how to get off the ground if somebody has got you pinned down, uh, how to uh, do a straight arm bar takedown, which is a very controlled way to take somebody that's combative and using their arm to simply put them down on the ground and, and get them into custody without hurting them and without hurting yourself. And then we have dynamic testing. If we could play that next video. And I'll talk over this uh, video a little bit to kind of show you all uh, or tell you a little bit about what's going on. Uh, it's the one from the, you know, there we go, the VLC player. we will get to watch the obstacle force being run. Uh, you know, one of the mistakes that uh, recruits uh, sometimes make is they look at, uh, they look at folks that have been doing this for a minute or two and they think, well, if that guy can do it, then, you know. All of our we have lights and you can see the scenario is out and then in front of the So when that happens, we so, uh, they're trying to uh, 
uh, basically, uh, there we go, somebody trying to basically get the best of him. And so the officer is the one in the gray shirt and the assailant is the one in the uh, in the black shirt. And so we get the heart rate up, we get the head spinning, we simulate uh, the adrenaline. And now what the officer has to do is break free. And so that's what uh, that's what this week culminates in, is finding out uh, if the uh, cadet is capable of getting away. And as you can see, uh, the cadet on the bottom who is uh, playing the assailant is not allowing his uh, classmate to, uh, to break free. The uh, rule is if you uh, don't give the old college try, uh, when you're uh, the assailant, uh, the instructor, the one that uh, matches up with you. And as you can see, we call him the human action figure. Uh, he looks like a GI Joe. So, uh, but anyway, all of this is designed to test that the officer can break free, can do things that are in a uh, legal, uh, constitutionally sound and ethical manner. And this, this cadet was having some, some trouble breaking free. So anyway, he passed. We can go ahead and go on to the next slide. But as you can see, I mean, we're not, you know, we don't teach, we don't teach, uh, you know, uh, street fighting. Uh, what we teach are techniques and tactics. I don't know if you noticed, but there were a couple of times where the cadet delivered a, a knee strike, a knee to the side of the leg. Uh, or to the uh, the buttocks of the other person, areas where there are what are called nerve motor points with the sole intention of not having to deliver more strikes, but being able to stun the uh, central nervous system so the officer can break free and can uh, can take that person into custody or tactically retreat uh, if need be. Physical fitness is very important uh, at the police academy. As I was saying, uh, you know, the cadet, uh, incoming cadet would make a very poor choice if they looked at people who were had been in this for a while, worked night shift for 10 or 15 years, uh, and uh, you know the only thing open at, at night is crystals and uh, Krispy Kreme and uh, really bad things to eat. And so we do have some that show up uh, out of shape. Uh, we have a 12-week uh, physical fitness program that is uh, pretty good at getting these cadets to the point where they can pass the obstacle course. So uh, we do high-intensity interval training uh, it's sort of similar to P90X and some of those things from uh, back a few years ago. We do some running, but not as much. And what you're seeing here is uh, cadets running the hill. This was actually an afternoon uh, PT session that was used to correct poor performance. So one of the, one of the lessons that we drive home to, uh, to our cadets is that when you have a bad encounter with somebody, when you're rude to somebody, when you do something wrong to somebody, it's not you that's going to pay the price for that. It's the other officer that deals with that person next. It's the officer that deals with that person's family in a month that's going to have to deal with the seed that you sowed. So we learn very quickly that, you know, fair or not, our profession, we all tend to get lumped in to the same bucket when bad things happen. And so we train these officers the same way. Everybody pays for somebody else's mistake. Uh, at the academy. And it also builds physical fitness, uh, which as you can see here, not everybody is uh, super fit in that picture, uh, but uh, we will have most of those folks will pass the obstacle course uh, at the end. Speaking of the obstacle course, uh, this is narrated and it's pretty interesting. You're going to see a lot of job specific things when it comes to a physical fitness test. Uh, we have to be able to defend that test in court. Uh, we have used this obstacle course since 1992 and it is job specific. There is one standard, one time standard for this obstacle course. There is no male standard and female standard. There is one standard for this uh, obstacle course. First Go ahead, sir. is gonna be your standard guardrail. The next one's gonna be a jersey wall that gets you on the interstate or a highway. All right, and then the third obstacle is gonna be a chain link fence and a solid wall, okay? You can just use the chain link fence to get over it or just a solid wall or a combination of both. This is the most common way to go over that wall. Go to the top and get over. This video is designed to be viewed by okay. incoming cadets so that they understand what they're going to have to do on the obstacle got, uh, course. Uh, that, that, that guy right there running it is one of our attorneys. He's also one of our After firearms instructors. He, he has more energy. I swear if we could find a way to harness his energy, we could probably power a thousand homes. Go up the back side of the stairs. And he, this is slow and for him, and he will wind up running this in about two minutes and 40 seconds. And that's stopping on top of the wall. 
you know, these are all things that an officer will have to do. You know, the balance beam, uh, that was one of the things I looked at and said, well, you got to get rid of this balance beam. Like, when are you going to tiptoe across a piece of wood, uh, you know, on the job? And uh, I've never been a, a sheriff's deputy. And I was uh, reminded by one of our instructors who spent a lot of time uh, working in the uh, uh, rural parts of our state that sometimes you have to run across a log over a creek because it sure beats getting wet in the middle of January. So gonna drop the dummy that simulates dragging a citizen uh, or a another officer away from danger don't worry no the gunfire you hear nobody's shooting at him but the firing range is just to the right of that the hill, there's a bell towards the end You're by the way i want to say i was the one filming i ran with him and, and that was supposed to be filmed one piece at a time and he just kept going and so uh you know, they, they knew I would follow them. And so uh, they were all getting a big kick out of this too. So that's a little bit of a backstory there for that. But as you can see, there's a lot of running, physical fitness, uh, running across railroad tracks. Uh, and then he's going to run around some barrels and then finish. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. And that's a requirement to graduate. Uh, you've got to pass defensive tactics. You've got to pass investigations. You've got to pass uh, emergency vehicle operations, which we're going to show here in a second and you've got to pass the obstacle course. Uh, if you do not pass these things, you can come back and retry those things one time. And if you don't get it, then you've got to come back through the entire basic program. Uh, emergency vehicle operations is sort of the, the last uh, component that we'll talk about. And it is one of the most dangerous things that law enforcement officers do. Uh, we want to talk about this job as being dangerous because people uh, you know, may want to you know, assault us or take our lives, but in reality, the most dangerous thing that we do for ourselves and for the community is drive a police car. And so when responding to an emergency, law enforcement officers have to have both their lights and their sirens activated. There is no, uh, there is no exception in state law. If you're close and you want to turn everything off so you can sneak up on the bad guy, once you turn the lights and the sirens off, uh, you have to stop doing the three things uh, or not the three things. Uh, the, there's a couple of things on the next uh, page. Next slide, please. Um, running through uh, red lights. Ne next slide, please. Uh, running through red lights, stop signs, exceeding the speed limit. Uh, those are all things that when you do those, you have to have your lights and sirens on. And so it's very important. And we're going to, you can go ahead and play that in the background. Uh, this is just a little uh, sample of what the uh, cadets have to do. This is really a non, <laughs> excuse me, a non-emergency vehicle operators course because uh, it's done at low speeds. But one thing that is really important that we stress to our cadets and the law says that we are not, once we turn those lights and sirens on, we are 100% liable and responsible for what we do in that car and for the safety of your life and your property. And so we teach techniques for driving that help our cadets be able to control vehicles uh, you know, by the way, uh, parallel parking, I was a great parallel parker for about uh, a month uh, after the academy, and uh, and then I lost the skill. So uh, I avoid parallel parking like it's the plague. Uh, I will pay to park in a parking garage before I'll park for free on the street. But driving is a very high risk, high liability thing that we do, and uh, it results in about 15% of the line of duty deaths annually last year. 15% of the deaths uh, of law enforcement officers in this country uh, were behind the wheel of an automobile or in pursuits, which uh, are just exceedingly dangerous. Uh, you know, I've had times in my career where you're involved in something like that or an emergency response and, you know, everything's fine. And then you, you get to the end and you think, you know, I stopped before I went through that intersection. You know, I, I always like to stop and look every, you know, at every single lane, make eye contact with every person before I proceeded through. And there were some times uh, in emergency responses to other officers or in pursuits that I thought I stopped and I went back and watched the tape and I rolled through an intersection at 50 miles an hour. So, you know, you driving is really, really important. And the emergency vehicle operations course is one of the most important things that we do. Y'all see that? Uh, well, there was a little trailer down in the corner. Uh, we use that trailer for training. Uh, nobody lives there, uh, but uh, that's that, that one right there in the middle. Uh, that's a, a place where we have officers respond to for training. Next slide. Scenarios, which, by the way, the scenarios have changed. When I went through in 2010, uh, you know, you knew every time you put on, uh, we have these uh, pistols that shoot soap rounds. 
uh, for training. It's basically colored pieces of soap. And every time you strapped one of those on, you knew we were going to go shooting. And now our training reflects the way we want officers to operate in the field. And that is use verbal de-escalation, use techniques and tactics that allow you to avoid putting yourself in a position where you might have to use deadly force. And so every one of our scenarios is winnable without firing a shot. So that is uh, one thing that, uh, that, we, that I'm really proud of is the, the thought and the effort that's gone into that. Now, you've seen all about Toledo. We train at our facility. The highway patrol trains there. They do the uh, driving and the firearms. Their dormitory is about a, uh, a mile away. Uh, we train uh, TBI agents, Tennessee Department of Corrections special agents train on our property. Uh, our firing range is in use uh, almost every week out of the year. And uh, we, our driving track is the same. Our gymnasium is heavily used. And so we are already operating this Melita concept, multi-agency law enforcement training academy. But like I said at the beginning, our governor is very, very generous. Governor Haslam started this idea, and Governor Lee has gotten the follow-through on it. And so we hope this spring to be able to break ground uh, over by John, that's John Toon Airport right there, and uh, River Bend Maximum Security uh, Prison. And uh, we hope to have a uh, brand new shiny academy uh, out there in Cockrell Bend. Uh, and we hope to have it open in about four years. And you can see all the agencies that are going to be resident agencies there. Department of Correction, uh, you know, they train correctional officers. They don't train law enforcement, but they're going to be there. The Highway Patrol uh, will be there. Of course, we'll be there. And the TBI will be there as well. So uh, the future is very bright. And if we could go to the last slide here, I just wanted to say that this was my class. I'm right up there in the corner uh, on uh, July 30th, 2010. And they said I looked an awful lot like the director of the academy. So on graduation day, that's me sitting behind the desk that I now sit behind at work, which is wild. And the, uh, the, the night before uh, my first day on the job, I got in and, and they, the office was open. I didn't have keys or anything, but I went in and I just sat down and I couldn't believe it. Uh, I thank God every day for, uh, for, for where he has led me. And uh, I just pray that, that I do a great job for these agencies, that, that our instructors, that they do the right things and that we give, uh, we give these officers a, a fighting chance to, to survive and that we do what's best for the safety of the general public as well. So anyway, uh, it is just such an honor to be here and uh, an honor to be at the Tennessee Law Enforcement Training Academy. And if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Hi there. In my past life, um, I used to do some work for a large telecom, and I did a lot of work in the Cockrell Bend area, so I have some familiarity with it. Is this new, is it Melita? Melita. Melita, thank you. The Melita Academy or the complex, is that going to be utilizing any of the uh, property that was uh, for the old Tennessee State Prison, or what? How, how is it going to be? I didn't quite see when I was sitting how it's going to be um, featured or how you guys are going to arrange it there on that um, kind of like little peninsula as Cockrell Bend. Right, so the, the state prison is on the other side of Briley Parkway. We are down by John Toon Airport. Uh, we're actually, the prison property that's there that's not in use, they're actually gonna tear all that down. Uh, the, uh, there are two, two or three active prisons and uh, you know, we're, gonna have, we're gonna have a huge firing range complex. I'll just share this funny story. The uh, airport uh, there is going to start a skydiver training program. And uh, it's terrifying for us because you know, somebody lands in the middle of your firing range, that's a bad day. But uh, the prisons are really, really uh, unhappy about that because, you know, somebody lands in the middle of uh, the maximum security yard at Riverbend. Uh, that's that may be the best uh, the, uh, the the best. Um, uh, that may be the best motivation not to land off course. Um, <laughs> yes. Sir. Negative. Uh, so on the transmission question, uh, no, everything is automatic. Uh, we actually have a about four hours where we take the annual lock brake fuse out, and they have to learn the cadets have to learn how to drive a a car with standard brakes. We're actually probably going to eliminate that at some point because if the ABS light comes on in the car, the first place you should go is the mechanic. Um, so that's the uh, the best part of, uh, of of technology, I guess. And what made me want to get into uh, law enforcement? 
Uh, well, my grandfather was uh, was a sergeant with the Metropolitan Nashville Police Department, and he retired. So I grew up hearing the stories, uh, you know, playing cops and robbers as a little kid. Was never the robber. Uh, always wanted to be the uh, the policeman. And uh, you know, I grew up hearing those stories. But I, I love broadcast. I still do. I miss it. April is a very hard month. Uh, when minor league baseball starts, I want to be at the ballpark. I want to be uh, calling the balls and strikes. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it, that is a very tough month, but I just felt empty and I wanted to serve my community. And, uh, and so it was right about the time that Philip Fulmer got uh, fired. And uh, we were talking about that on a daily basis. And uh, I don't know, it just felt very empty. And uh, funny story though, I was at a silent auction a few years later and, uh, he came up, he said, you look real familiar. I was in law enforcement at the time, about a year into it, two years into it. I said, yes, sir. I used to work for WIVK. I covered your football team every day. And his hand was on my shoulder and it kind of went around my neck. And uh, I had won a uh, shotgun shooting experience with, uh, with coach Fulmer. And he said, you sure you want to go out there with me? And I was like, yes, sir. And it was actually great. Uh, he, he was very uh, generous. Thank you. From a, from a training academy point of view, what went wrong in Memphis? So I'm also the executive secretary of the Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission. I don't want to comment on anything that may come in front of the post commission, uh, but I think uh, we'll all we'll all wait and see uh, what comes out on that. But I can tell you, I can only tell you what we do at Toledo and what well, and hopefully Brentwood PD would agree they send us their officers. Uh, but we want, we want men and women that come out of our academy to not only be physically fit, right? If you're physically fit, you're, you're going to be healthier and healthy, healthy cops or good cops uh, because they're not, uh, you know, battling the things that, that unhealthy people battle. Uh, we want officers that come out that, that not only know the law, but have a great respect for the constitutional rights of Tennesseans uh, and, and, of course, anybody in the state. But... Uh, you know, it is a, uh, I don't sleep real well on Thursday nights uh, before we graduate classes on Friday. I worry about those cadets. I, I know we, we provide every class is the best trained class that we've ever had. We're constantly changing. We're constantly looking at, at scenarios and situations. Uh, and I, I just don't sleep well. I worry about them. I worry, do we do enough? And it, it, and I've been a chief. I've been a chief of police, and it's terrifying. You got officers that are out. You can't be with them 24 hours a day. Matter of fact, you can't even be with them sometimes when you're at work. You're in your office doing paperwork and, you know, uh, killing trees, uh, you know, for uh, for the city council or something like that. Uh, you know, printing out a thousand pages of documentation or something. But, uh, you know, we we want to make sure that the cadets that come out of our academy, the cadets that serve my parents, y'all. Uh, and I and I do. I don't know if your cadets tell you, but uh, I pull them aside and uh, Brentwood PD and Williamson County PD or Williamson County Sheriff's Office. And I tell them that uh, I'll keep and I do. I keep my eye on them because these are the people that are going to be serving my mom and dad uh, in their time of need. Uh, you know, we we deal with people on the worst day of their lives. Very rarely do people call the police up and say, hey, come over. Let's just talk. Right. So it's for somebody, whether you're pulling somebody over or they've had a, a burglary or God forbid, a robbery, one of the five on average, um, you know, uh, whatever the situation is, it's the worst day of their life. And we need to not be part of the problem. We need to be part of the solution. We need to help protect people. Sometimes protecting people is taking them to jail. Um, and we need to make sure that, that when we do that, we use appropriate force. The force ends uh, when it's supposed to end uh, and that officers uh, act in an ethical and legal manner. Uh, and I, I can tell you that, uh, that when it comes to defensive tactics and use of force, like we don't put up with people cutting up and cutting around about, uh, you know, things they might think are funny. We educate those cadets real quick that uh, this is not a game, that it's serious. And you can, you can make a mistake and wind up in, you can make a mistake and wind up in prison for the rest of your life. So uh, it's a, it's a big responsibility. I'm sorry. I hope. Okay. These guys, the Memphis City, four guys are one time. Just not a check because of the fact that they're there. I know they must have been splintered. 
Is that a personality thing that maybe is that you're trying to be the can or somebody say, well, you know, hey, yeah, I think I'm a little bit more quirky than what you're trying to do. Anger issue comes into play. Is there any commonality with it? Well, I've, I've only seen, I've, so everything y'all have seen is what I've seen. Uh, and so I will say this, we don't train the Memphis Police Department. Uh, if we see problems with an officer at basic training at the Tennessee Law Enforcement Training Academy, we will pick up the phone and we will call that department. And we have. Uh, and sometimes it's not even comments about, you know, uh, or, or indications that they're going to go over the top. Sometimes it's that, uh, you know, we had one an active shooter where the cadet made a comment about, well, I'm not going to go in. If, if You know, I'm going to get my kid first and I'm not going to worry about the shooter. Well, I'm sorry. That, you know, that's why we had Uvalde. So, uh, you know, you, you, your job is to go in that building and take care of the threat. So uh, we, I can only speak to what we do in training at Toledo. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we look at these officers that come in, but we don't select them either. So the ones that come into us, they're picked by the local agencies. Uh, those are who those agencies want to police their communities. They pass a criminal history check, a background check. They pass a psychological exam. Uh, and so you know, the one the one problem we have, uh, like every other profession, every other group on this planet, is we have to hire human beings. And uh, and so humans are, are imperfect. And uh, so it, it is tough. Do you all know how many officers there are in Tennessee? Approximate how many law enforcement officers that we uh, regulate post commission? 11,000? 18,000. So there are 18,000 men and women in this state that, you know, and I, and I can speak to this too. I'm a law enforcement spouse. My wife is a police officer. Uh, when she gets called out to go do her stuff, which when she's called out, it's not good. And so uh, I know what it's like to, uh, to, to have that fear and that uh, wonder if she's going to come back home. And uh, there's 18,000 men and women that uh, strap on their equipment, go to work every day, and they're willing to die for people they don't even know. So I have a great deal of respect for the men and women that put the uniform on every single day. Uh, I'm lucky I, I get to stay behind a desk and, you know, we, we lock our front door at the academy and people can't get in, although I do work one day a week on the road in Berry Hill. So I don't speed down 8th Avenue South on Thursday evenings. But, uh, you know, I have a great deal of respect for the men and women that do this job. And the, and the ones that choose to do it now, after the sentiment, the tide, you know, when I went in the academy, I mean, we weren't like winning popularity contests, but people love the law enforcement, they love police. And, uh, and now uh, there's just so much negative coverage. Uh, the people that choose to do it now have a great deal of respect. Chip, thank you so much. That was, uh, that was an amazing presentation. I was telling your dad, I texted my friend in the governor's office while you were talking and, um, the response back was, oh my gosh, Chip, he represents this state so well. We're lucky to have him. So that was kind of cool. So we give our speakers as a gift, a pen that has our logo on it. And if you would sign this book about Rotary that we read to first graders, we will also tell them about your visit to our club when we read the book. Thank you so much for being here today. For anybody who plans to go to Dixon after Rotary today to Sherry Koss's husband's uh, service, please, you know, just stay up front and we'll coordinate carpools or whatever. And for everybody else, if there's nothing else for the good of Rotary, please help put the tables and chairs away and we're adjourned. <laughs>